this feels like homecoming. It's wonderful Woo! to be back together. Very few of you have seen me with curly hair, but I did at one point have these curly hairs. I, I never know what I'm going to say in my plenary, just as Steve and I never know what the next edition is going to look like, but somehow it rolls around when we, uh, when we get here. And I just want to say I do have the two qualifications. I'm an expert. I'm from more than 500 miles away. <laughs> And I have slides. So. <laughs> Just a little bit of a, uh, an update here. There are now about 200 controlled trials and motivational interviewing appearing every year. It's, a, it's astonishing to keep up with. And we're just about to cross the 2,000 controlled trials line in the uh, cumulative bibliography that I keep. There are more than, there's so many studies now, there are more than 200 meta-analyses and systematic reviews of, uh, of motivational interviewing research. Uh, there have been somewhere north of 3,000 people through the TNT, so we've got uh, more than 3,000 trainers around the world speaking 61 languages at least. And if you follow Google Scholar, it's about 11,000 new articles mentioning the MI every year. So it's uh, a very rapidly burgeoning literature. If you just look at Google Scholar citations, you can see it's very much on an upward bending curve. So uh, what we're here talking about is growing very quickly. Just want to give you some developments from the field that I wanted to to mention. It's astonishing if you follow controlled trials on all of the topics and from all of the places. So just this year, just 2022, a uh, study from New Zealand using motivational living to promote employment, to promote working, uh, motivating health behavior for people with ischemic heart disease in Lithuania, uh, helping mothers improve their children's oral health in Mexico. Uh, interviewing child, this is from the Allisons, uh, interviewing child sexual abuse suspects to get useful information from them. Uh, small self-help groups for alcohol dependence in Pakistan using motivational interviewing. U.S. study encouraging recycling. Uh, addressing fear of childbirth in Turkey. Encouraging dairy herd health management activities in Sweden. This is not with the cows. <laughs> it's, 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 it's with the it's with the farmers. <laughs> Supporting present the parents as proxies for their children's healthy eating in the United States, preventing pre-HIV exposure in Thailand, and preventing spiritual hopelessness in dialysis patients in Indonesia. So just the range of topics that are being addressed now is, is mind-bending. And this is around the world, in, in many cultures where usually Western approaches don't cross very well, uh, somehow motivational interviewing is finding uh, a home in many different places. There are lots of theories about why motivational interviewing works. So, Pick a theory of psychotherapy, and they have a theory about why motivational interviewing is working. Uh, it's, it's sort of like a Rorschach plot, I think. However, however you think about psychotherapy, you have a way of explaining why it is that motivational interviewing seems to be working. And it's interesting how many different theoretical perspectives are you interested in in writing about MI. AI is definitely uh, on the move in motivational interviewing. If you're a coder, you know how long it takes to code a sample yourself. Uh, and there are now technology feeding interviews through speech recognition software, and then the transcript being analyzed to look for reflections and questions and things like that. 
So how close can you get to what a human being, a human coder will do? Well, it's impressively close. It's not so good at recognizing change talk. Pretty good at questions and reflections. You know? So uh, I guess the advantage of AI is that rather than coding two or three samples in an afternoon, you can code about 5,000. <laughs> because it's automated. And this is now being used as a way of giving some feedback to people who are learning the MI. Uh, and I think it'll only get better over time. So it's something that we need to be paying attention to. Uh, and also now findings are emerging from studies using this kind of AI coding. For example, one that makes sense to me, the more time physicians spend talking, the less likely they were to be engaging in my consistent behavior. <laughs> Very sensible and then talk, talk less. <laughs> Lots of stuff happening in research on uh, training and learning of motivational interviewing. I, I think we have one of the largest literatures on how to teach this approach of, of any therapeutic method, including CBT. Uh, we've been studying, well, primarily because of my first study where I found very little evidence that I had been there as a trainer. <laughs> Like, like good studies, it raises good questions, you know, like, well, what does it actually take to help people learn this method? And we know a lot about that now. Uh, we know that MI is learnable, but it's not too easy to learn it on your own by reading or watching videos. Some people seem to be able to get pretty close with that, but it's, it's tough. We know that people often overestimate their proficiency in MI, that we learned from my initial embarrassing study uh, where we found very little evidence of MI in the post-training tapes, but people were very confident that they were doing motivational interviewing. Uh, so just keep that one in mind. Uh, we have not found a relationship between the ability to learn motivational interviewing and the number of years of advanced education. So it doesn't seem to be about having enough graduate degrees, in fact, they can even get in the way of learning in one. Uh, one of the better predictors of learning MI well is having pretty good skills in accurate empathy and in, in reflective listening to begin with. In one study that Terry and I were involved in, we screened for listening skills because we didn't have very long to teach motivational interviewing plus a lot of CBT. Uh, and it turns out if you have pretty good listening skills, it's not that big a step to learn uh, the, the rest of MI. So uh, that's a good head start and, and one of the first things to teach people if they don't have those listening skills. Uh, just coming to a workshop or coming to a class uh, typically results in fairly small changes that also tend to be short lived They go away. Uh, people go back to practicing the way they were before. And I don't know actually why we ever thought that having people come into a workshop and warm a chair for a day or two would change their behavior. We wouldn't, we wouldn't expect that of our clients, you know. But somehow we, that's our continuing education model, right? Um, the good news though is a fairly modest amount of feedback and coaching can make a real difference in proficiency. So in our first randomized trial of different training methods, we found that either feedback or coaching made a significant difference in acquiring MI skills and in maintenance of those skills, and that the combination of them was the only thing that increased client change talk. So it makes sense that feedback and coaching would be used uh, together. And that's what you now know, that uh, beyond just doing workshops and talking about have people practice, develop their skills, give them some feedback, and some, uh, some gentle coaching. And there is no standard dose of training. How many uh, training days does it take to learn MI? Well, it depends. Some people are very fast learners. There are some prodigies, people who come to a workshop and seem to have a pretty good sense of it. But it's not most people. Most of us need more than just coming to a workshop and a class to develop some proficiency in this. So those are high-level uh, summaries of what we know from training.
training research. And there's this interesting study by Lenoir and, and Goudreau on teaching doctors, teaching health professionals, motivational interviewing, and they said it really takes a paradigm shift. Uh, and they found that the, the medical professionals that they're working with are changing from thinking of themselves as health experts to health guides, from uh, confronting patients with what they have to do to accepting and honoring the fact that the patients do get to make the choices about what they're going to do, from trying to impose or insert things into, into patients to collaborating with patients, and from trying to protect to a, a more compassionate approach. So it's something we do kind of know that the learning MI also involves some change in the way you think about the work that you're doing. I've gotten interested in ambivalence in the last few years. Every now and then there's a topic that, that captures my imagination. <laughs> you get it? It takes a little while sometimes. <laughs> but ambivalence is an absolutely human nature. I mean, it is worldwide. It is a phenomenon in, in, in each and every culture. Uh, and uh, I've been studying it for at least 50 years because I work in addiction and motivational interviewing and experiencing it a good deal longer than that. And it, it's an interesting phenomenon. And so this uh, book on second hand, Second thought uh, is what, we, what I learned about ambivalence. But it's something fairly central to, to what we do. And yet I'm getting more ambivalent about ambivalence. You know? <laughs> because ambivalence implies two choices, you know, drink or not drink, you know, whatever. And often it's much more complex than that. You know, the, the candy store issue in ambivalence is I have all these choices in front of me, I don't know which one to go with which is a little more like career choices, you know. And that growth is more often not about this or that, but rather, you know, finding what it is that you live from a, a love from a huge range of options. Uh, so MI is not just about ambivalence, or at least we have to expand to the multivalence, to, to uh, having a lot of choices uh, from which to make selections. So it, ambivalence is a little bit limiting, you know. It, it, but still a useful concept in MI. As I began writing about uh, ambivalence, I was also thinking about clinical cases that I had seen. Um, now, we usually think of ambivalence as conscious. You know, I want this or I want that. I can't quite decide which, which way I want to go. So both sides of it are something that you're aware of. But I also know from clinical practice that sometimes part of the ambivalence is something the person is not aware of. And the, one of the ones that I ran into most often in my own practice was people who get into relationships that are destructive uh, and then, then they get out of the relationship and they pick another relationship just like that. They keep being attracted to the same kind of person and, and it's chemical attraction. Powerful, this is the person I want to be with. But ironically, it's exactly the wrong kind of person for them. You know? What is that about? Well, what, one woman that I worked with had been through four or five dramatic uh, relationships with catastrophic endings and throwing glassware and you know all that sort of stuff. Uh, what she what she was doing is she was attracted. This is an Albuquerque where we have a lot of physicists married to counselors, you know. <laughs> she would be attracted to guys who were kind of emotionally distant uh, and, and kind of shut down emotionally, not people, not people real comfortable with their own feelings. But she had the sense that inside there is a teddy bear, you know, and, I'm, and I want to get to that person. So she'd be powerfully attracted to these men. And then as they got into a relationship, she began, begins pushing more and more for affect, for emotional warmth. You know? And of course, the more she pushes for that, the more the guy backs away. You know? uh, 
Uh, it's, it's a demand withdraw dynamic that Andy Christensen and others have, have written about. And it would get worse and worse because she would become more and more demanding to see the, the feeling and the romance and the uh, emotion. And you know, that, that was threatening and it would, would end in a, usually a pretty dramatic way. So what was going on? But, because there's, she's picking guys that are just the wrong kind of guy. I mean, I was, I was saying, how about dating men who are like affection, affectionate to begin with? <laughs> <laughs> Seemed very sensible to me. <laughs> I married one who worked for me. And she said, I'm just not attracted to them. I don't, I don't have the chemistry. I mean, you know, if I, if I date a guy that's overtly affectionate, just doesn't do it for me. You know? well, that's, that's interesting, you get attracted to exactly the wrong kind of person. And then one day I just said, well, tell me about your father. And she said, well, we, you know, we knew that he loved us, but he never really told us. And she began to describe this emotionally uh, isolated, cold, distant character that she kind of knew loved her, but never, never hugged, never said, I love you. And right there, it just kind of hit her. Oh my God! You know, I'm, I'm trying to redo my father. I'm trying to. I get attracted to guys who are like Dan, and then I imagine I'm going to be able to get them to be uh, warm and fuzzy and teddy bearish. You know? So sometimes it's that. And in, in uh, the book, I talk about it at some length one of my own experiences of that kind of ambivalence of. Being really stuck, people with this, with this kind of ambivalence are puzzled by their own behavior. They can't quite figure out why they're doing what they're doing. They have what Freud would have called the repetition compulsion, but it doesn't make sense to them. They can't figure out why. Well, part of it is one of the powerful motivations uh, is one they're not aware of. And Alan Zukoff is going to talk more about this uh, tomorrow. Um, and, and indeed has written a humanistic Rogerian understanding of this kind of ambivalence. Uh, Rogers talked about parts of ourselves that are unacceptable, and so we push them aside. We don't say that's not that's not me. Uh, and there's a root of this kind of um, vertical ambivalence. You know? And to get to horizontal, when you, when you're there, to get to horizontal ambivalence, where you're conscious of both sides, Alan says, is a developmental achievement. And he's not alone. Scott Fitzgerald says, test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still be sane you know, and, and still, still retain your ability to function. You know? uh, if you think about leaders, often you want a leader who's more ambivalent, who doesn't make uh, decisions impulsively, but takes a little time to think about the possibilities and consider the pros and cons of them. And uh, Siegel has a, a lovely article saying it's an achievement to own your own ambivalence rather than projecting part of it onto other people. You know? So as I began writing about ambivalence, I began thinking it's not such a bad thing, actually. You know? People who experience more ambivalence, the research says, uh, tend to be better informed and make more accurate judgments about them tend to, when they do evaluations, they tend to be more fair and balanced in the process. So it's the kind of person you want for a, a judge, in a way. They read other people's emotions more accurately. Isn't that one interesting? You know? They're more open to new information uh, and, and to uh, alternatives. They tend to be more creative and see unusual associations, even on the ink plots. You know, just kind of see things that other people might not think of. Uh, in one study, experience more sexual arousal and desire, and are less inclined to make impulsive decisions, which is good when you experience more sexual arousal. <laughs> so I don't think we should stamp out ambivalence. I don't think life would be better without it. Um, and it doesn't have to be upsetting. Actually, it's, it's a personality difference how tolerant you are of ambivalence. Some people are perfectly comfortable with ambivalence, just kind of, what is? 
Other people can't stand it, want to resolve it and you know, make a decision and move on with it. Uh, and, and those opposites marry each other sometimes. You know, it certainly happened in my case. Uh, and considering different alternative futures and choosing among them is something I think pretty importantly unique about human beings. We actually envision futures and consider possibilities and think about them and decide among them. And it's certainly a defining characteristic of democracies uh, as well. So, we're not, we're not free from ambivalence and mint, I must say. Yeah. Is it my manipulative? It's a question we've been discussing for decades. You know? are, are we doing something kind of un, unfair here? Well, a dramatic example this year in Denmark was the Danish police have been using mandatory monthly motivational interviews. Think about that phrase. Mandatory monthly motivational interviews. It doesn't sound like something you want to participate in. With refugees who are in Denmark but have been refused asylum. So they, they, they don't throw them out. In the U.S., we have a different solution for that, just throw people out. But they're still living there, but they're not leaving. And so the Danish police thought, well, maybe we can do motivational interviewing to get these people to leave Denmark. The good news is it was dramatically unsuccessful. <laughs> like, like virtually no one left Denmark. <laughs> as a result of mandatory monthly motivational interviews. <laughs> and both the police and the refugees hated it. <laughs> so that, um, that's a very happy outcome for me. <laughs> Glad to see that. And I honestly, when I think about it, I don't know of any scientific evidence that you can use motivational interview to override someone's autonomy. That you can cause them to do something that is not in their own best interests. Now, you can't prove that because it would only take one case to, to disprove it. Uh, but so far, I don't, I don't see a lot of, I don't see any scientific evidence that worries us that we're doing something nefarious uh, here. But it's a lingering ambivalence about motivation and viewing. What about counseling with neutrality? This is an idea that Steve Richards and I introduced in the second edition. Because we, of what we learned about motivational interviewing, it actually tells us how to be neutral better. You know that if you ask questions, the answer to which is change talk, if you reflect change talk, uh, if you affirm it, if you put it into summaries, people tend to move in that direction. And we know you can do that inadvertently without realizing you're doing it. Uh, and once you know that, if you choose to be neutral, if you talking to a client about something where your opinion is you should not be tipping the balance one way or the other here, you know, you know better how to do that, which, which is to be careful not to differentially and ask questions and reflect and affirm and do summaries just on one side of the balance. Okay? So, so then in the third edition, we also changed from directive, we used to call it um, client-centered directive approach. Directional is a better description. We, we have a sense of what direction you're moving in you know, without being the person that's pu pushing the person to do that. All right? But I think we remain ambivalent about this. In this uh, survey by uh, Foreman and Moyers, about half of Mindy's said they always encourage their trainees to maintain the attitude of equipoise, that is, to not be directional, but to always be neutral. Now, from a Rogerian, non-directive perspective, that kind of makes sense. Although, as, as I talk to people in the Rogerian community, they're not always non-directive. Uh, and Rogers himself gave up the term non-directive in favor of person-centered. But maybe we are kind of ambivalent about whether we ought to be doing this evoking thing or should just always be neutral. And that's a choice that you make, of course. 
Now, I don't remember neutrality coming up in my own clinical training to, to be conscious of when I'm trying not to tip the balance and when I am. But you would do very different things depending on whether you're wanting to encourage the person to move in a particular direction or whether you're wanting to stay out of it. The example I used to stay out of it in, in the first article of, on MI was someone trying to decide whether to have children. And as a parent, I know I've got no business encouraging one way or the other here. That's a, that's a choice the person needs to make, and I need to stay out of it. And now I know, because of what we've learned in MI, how to do that better, how to, how to be more neutral. So what's different about MI4? You know, it's pretty well a moment where we're just about to do the last rewrites based on uh, the last set of comments from the editors at Guilford. Guilford is amazing in the quality of developmental editing that they provide. I certainly have worked with publishers who pretty much publish what you send them. Uh, with Guilford, I know I'm going to be doing a lot of rewriting, and I'm grateful for it because the books are so much better um, because of the quality of the editors there. So we've been rewriting, 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 and now we've got the last set of edits, uh, and we're about to start kind of the final uh, loop. So what's different? Well, we were inspired, first of all, by this quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., the Chief Justice. I would not give a fig for the simplicity this side of the complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the far side of complexity. When you begin to understand something well enough, you can begin to make it simpler again. You can begin to explain it in simple language. In fact, if you can't explain it in simple language, you probably don't understand it well enough. Well, we've been at this going on you know, 40 years now, and getting to the place where I think we have a pretty good grasp of the complexity. Each edition of the book, as you know, has gotten bigger and fatter and more complicated in a way. And we said we don't want to do that again. We don't want to make an even bigger, even more complicated fourth edition. What we want to do is to try to simplify it. Say, what have we learned from all of this? And how might you say that in more everyday language? And the, a good reason for that, that we, and we've, again, almost completely rewritten the book, so we never have started with the um, file of the previous edition and just made minor tweaks. Every time we've started at the beginning and completely rewrote the book. And a good reason for doing that is so many people are using MI now in so many different fields, way outside psychotherapy. Uh, that we wanted to write a book that is accessible more, more broadly to, to readers who can kind of get the essence of MI and learn how to do it, but without a lot of psychotherapy jargon in it. So, much wider applications being used in, in coaching. And Steve has a book on sports, and he's indeed working with top level football coaches uh, around applying MI. In, in coaching the top professional teams. Uh, leadership, management, I mean, you're hearing these kinds of applications here. And so we wanted to have less psychotherapy jargon in it, because you know? that's, that's off-putting for people who aren't psychotherapists, you know? uh, and yet this is something that's more broadly useful, so we struggled with this. Uh, we, we didn't write a book for the general public, Guilford said, if, if you want to write a book for the general public, do it, but not this one. Because <laughs> this, this is the source book on motivational interviewing, so we don't want to lose that quality. So we wrote for helpers more broadly, with, with less technical specialist jargon, and have a sense that that's where the field is going, and that's where the research is going, to so applications in many more areas well beyond psychotherapy. And yet, psychotherapists are principal users of this. Well, ambivalence, okay. <laughs> well, you see some of this in the subtitles of our books. 
The subtitle of the first edition was Preparing People to Change Addictive Behavior. And then 10 years later, it was being used much more broadly, and so it became Preparing People for Change, not just addictive behavior. Uh, and then it wasn't just help, it wasn't just preparing for change anymore. It's helping people change. Because actually MI is something that you can use all the way through the trans theoretical stages or where, wherever you are. Uh, that we, I think, created the sense that once you have a plan, now you're done with MI. But many things were saying, no, I don't, I don't feel like I put it down at that point. It's not like, okay, done with that stuff, now we go on to, to directive approach. Uh, so we were getting feedback from, from Mint, which has been so helpful in each edition, that no, this has kind of become a way of doing the work that I do. And I'm now saying MI is a way of doing what else you do. And so the subtitle for the fourth edition is Helping People Change and Grow. So we're adding a growth component to it uh, beyond just uh, acute change looking at the broader picture as well. So no longer just preparing, no longer just about addictive behaviors, much more broadly about change. Uh, the definition keeps evolving, that we actually forgot to give one in the first edition. <laughs> and I think we made up with, with three definitions in the third edition. <laughs> it's a way of talking to people about change. It's always been that. It's a way of having a conversation about change that brings out the person's own motivation and their own commitment to change. So that's fundamentally what it is. I mean, you can use whatever definition from previous editions you want to use. Someone uh, earlier this week said, can I, I love the second edition. Can I keep using the second edition? Well, of course you can, no problem. Yeah. This is just kind of reflecting where our, our thinking is going. Now, the good news is, there's a lot we're not changing. We're not changing the four processes. They, they, will, they stay the same. We're not changing wars. We're not changing change talk. We're not changing sustain talk. We're not changing darn cats. You know? Although if you speak a language other than English, that doesn't work for you. But at least, at least in English, we're keeping that. We're not changing discord. The realization that our third edition that resistance was a problematic concept that it's kind of blaming people for not getting well uh, and so we disaggregated it into sustained talk which was most of what we were calling resistance nothing unusual about sustained talk it's just half of ambivalence and then the interesting question if you subtract sustained talk from what therapists mean by resistance is there anything left and there is and that's what we call discord and that's, that's language not about the intended change. You know, I, I don't think I can stop smoking, I don't want to stop smoking, that's sustained talk. Discord tends to have the word you in it. You don't understand how hard it is for me. You can't make me change. Who are you to tell me what to do? You, know, you hear the word you, it's a comment on our relationship. It says, right now I'm uncomfortable with the way we're dancing together. You're stepping on my toes. And that's different from sustained talk. So we disaggregated resistance into those two things, and we've, we've stayed with that in the, in the fourth edition. We are making a change in the components of the spirit. We've used evocation there for quite a while, and we were using I mean, evoking is a process, uh, evocation was part of the spirit, I mean, it, it just was overused. And so we broadened it to the sense of empowerment. Uh, and that's now this component, rather than just evocation. Evocation is still part of empowerment. You're still honoring the person's own motivations, obviously, and calling those forth. But I think empowerment is a better, better term for this. Now you have to be careful because there are two dic dictionary definitions of empowerment. One is giving people authority they didn't have before. That's not what we mean. You know? The other is helping people realize and use their own strengths and their own abilities. And that's what we mean. You know? So empowerment is not giving people something they lack. 
It's helping them realize what they have. It's not, I have what you need and I'll give it to you. It is, you have what you need and together we'll find it. So that's, that's the essence of empowerment as we meet it. Um, it also affirms people's autonomy, their ability to make their own choices. In fact, there's not, there's not an alternative to that. You can't make people's choices for them, even with extreme coercion. And if you know the autonomy support scale and the mining, we've kind of moved from four to five. I think it was Alan that pointed this out to me. Uh, that, that four is, well, you accept and support the client's autonomy, but five is more than that. I mean, you, you, you're really adding significantly to the person's feeling of autonomy amplifying and strengthening that sense of it. So it's not just tolerating autonomy. Uh, it is honoring and, and uh, evoking autonomy. We've got four parts in the, in the fourth edition. Uh, we've got three introductory chapters uh, on helping on what is MI and how does MI sound, how does it flow. So. It's kind of the, the spirit, the method, and the flow of MI. Then we have four chapters on each of the four, and we now call them tasks. I think better general term than processes. Processes sounds a little specialist, you know, but tasks, everybody gets tasked. So, so each of those, a chapter on engaging, and one on focusing, one on evoking, one on planning, just as an introduction to what it is. You know. and, and then, deeper dives. So in part three, we have more chapters on those, those four tasks in different ways. So what, what do you do when your goals seem to differ? What, what if you can't find any change talk at all? What if you, there's no motivation that seems to be there? Well, we have a chapter that we call planting seeds uh, on that, uh, which we used to call developing discrepancy. But for the most part, discrepancy is already there. You know. But sometimes, uh, you're, you, maybe your goal is to create some ambivalence. So that's a, that's a first step. Because when you go from pre-contemplation to contemplation, the difference there is ambivalence versus thinking about it. Um, chapter on softening sustained talk and discord. So just going a little deeper on these aspects uh, beyond the, the four tasks themselves. And then again, we have a part four on learning and research about motivation and interviewing. And we anticipate the book will be about 20% smaller than the third edition. So it's simplifying, it's getting shorter, less complicated, jargony discussions. Um, and actually one, I think this is the next thing. Uh, no. Um, terminology change. In spirit, I already told you, going from evocation to empowerment, going from processes to tasks. So if you want to still call them processes, go right ahead, it's fine. Uh, Minty suggested, that, well, I couldn't track down who actually was the first one, but calling it the fixing reflex. I think that's better than writing reflex. And so we're now going to be calling it the fixing reflex, which is sort of more general language. We're recognizing simple versus complex affirmations, which we introduced, Terry and I introduced in the book on effective psychotherapists, where simple is an affirmation about some, something a person did or something a person said, or you know, a little more constrained. Whereas complex affirmation is something about the person that you're affirming, a strength that the person has, a characteristic or a trait of the person. So rather than saying, I, I like how you said that, you might say that, that took a lot of courage for you. you know? You're beginning to go a little deeper and recognize something stable and enduring about the person. Um, Steve and I struggled with uh, affirmation good, praise bad. Uh, and that's way too simple. You know? uh, and, and so we wound up with simple and complex affirmation. But be thinking about how you can make your affirmations complex rather than just so specific as to a behavior or a, something the person said. We're giving more attention to affirmation. 
Uh, I think we didn't give enough discussion to that in the past. And there's research now that affirmation is also a direct antecedent of change talk. That is, when you affirm, the next thing you're likely to hear is change talk. So now that's true of questions that ask for change talk. It's true of reflections of change talk, it's true of affirmations of change talk, and summaries of change talk. But it's also true of affirmations more generally. Uh, for reasons that I'll tell you about in just a minute, we're, we're saying more about genuineness, well, being yourself, uh, being who you are, and not putting on a role or a mask of some kind when you're doing motivational interview. I hadn't said much about that in the past. Um, sometimes in our early editions, we were almost equating giving advice um, with the writing reflex, with the fixing reflex. And actually, giving advice is entirely consistent with motivational interviewing if you do it in a certain way. You know? So it's not like if advice giving or information giving is bad. It's just that it's done in a way that's consistent with the spirit and method of MI. So we're being, we have, we're saying more about how to do that, how to give information and advice in an MI consistent way. Saying more about cultural adaptations of MI because for goodness sakes, it's happening all over the world. Uh, and remote delivery. Uh, during the pandemic, we've learned how much you can do with Zoom. You can do on the telephone. And can you deliver MI remotely? Well, it turns out you can. Uh, and clients don't seem to appreciate it less. And what we see so far is that it still works. You know, we need, need more research on that. But it's a different way of delivery. Uh, and so we say some about that as well. We've changed the documentation. So we're now using APA style. Uh, APA style, you may recognize, is, is a parenthesis and the names of the authors in the year. So when you're reading, you have to stop and skip over that to get to the next sentence. Non-psychologists aren't too used to that. It's like, this is weird, what is going on here? Physicians often use just the little footnotes, the little, little numbers. Uh, so you can find the reference if you want. Uh, but it doesn't keep you from reading. And so we're using numbered endnotes at the end of each chapter. So at the end of the chapter, you'll find the notes pertinent to that chapter that are numbered through the chapter. But as you're reading, it's just a little superscript that says, if you want to know a little more about this, or you want to know how come we're saying this, or where did this come from, you can go to the end of the chapter and it'll be there. So the documentation is just as good this remains the authoritative um, major text on motivational interviewing. And, but, and we haven't decreased documentation, but we changed it so that people who don't read APA style in their, in their everyday work can read this thing, and it's not, what's this? You know, long strings of authors. Some new features. Steve and I wrote a personal perspective to something speaking from our own individual voice. Um, in, in each chapter, so we've, we've contributed that. Worried about, our psychotherapists still going to love us? You know, because <laughs> we're kind of, you know, taking out all the jargon and so forth. Come up with the idea of, well, we have inset boxes for therapists, where we have some of the jargon, you know. Uh, so that people who aren't therapists can just skip over those. But therapists who want to hear a little bit more of their own language and how does this work in psychotherapy, there are boxes there in most chapters written for therapists as well. So we're trying to both end. You know. We have a list of key concepts at the end of each chapter, which means that we also updated the glossary of MI terms at the end of the book. So we've been working on this for a couple of years. You know. Now here's something that struck me. Terry and I wrote a book on effective psychotherapists. Uh, and this is the puzzle we we're working on. The, the idea that when you compare two different therapies done by people who are well trained in them and who believe in them, you, know, you compare psychoanalytic psychotherapy and behavioral psychotherapy and 
Gestalt psychotherapy, all done by people that that's what they do. Usually the outcomes are the same. There's usually not, not differences between those therapies and outcome. Which is very different from training when I was trained in the 70s. In the 70s you chose a school of psychotherapy and you went to that school and you learned what was cool about your school and what was wrong with everybody else's. <laughs> But since the 1930s, we've kind of known that when you compare bona fide therapies with each other, they usually have pretty similar outcomes, you know, in spite of what seem like major differences. Project Match, for example, we picked three therapies that were just as different as we could imagine. You know? Cognitive behavior therapy. Almost everybody at the table was a cognitive behavior therapist, so we were for sure going to do cognitive behavior therapy. What else? Well, 12 step. 12-step therapy is really popular in the States. So we constructed that 12-step therapy that, that Hazelden was comfortable with. Um, except they said, you're leaving out stuff like motivational interviewing. You know, so. <laughs> and cognitive behavior therapy. So, so they were already kind of integrating some of these other things. Uh, well, we had those two, a 12-session, 12 12-step 12 facilitation therapy and a 12-session cognitive behavior therapy. And we knew that we could handle three therapies in the design that we had. What's the third one? Well, motivational interview was kind of what emerged. It's, it's different from those other two, just theoretically, conceptually different. You know? and, uh, and it was like a session or two. And most people around the table said, that's not enough. You, know, you can't change people in a session or two. Can, can you like stretch it and make it longer? <laughs> So we had an assessment feedback from the drinkers, the drinkers checkup work that I had been doing uh, and called it motivational enhancement therapy. And then had a couple of follow-up sessions and so it became a four session motivational enhancement therapy, but basically still motivational interview. And so those were the three people randomly assigned to four sessions of MET or 12 sessions of one of the other two. And as you know, they finished dead even. Wonderful improvement in all the groups, no differences, in, uh, on, no statistically significant differences in the outcomes. Well, that's a very common finding. So, and it's so common that in 1936, Rosen's wife called it the Dodo Bird verdict, group drawing on Alice in Wonderland. That all have won and all must have prizes. So that was the reference there. And that's pretty well documented. And Bruce Wampold says, Certainly been the champion of the, and Scott Miller, uh, just documenting very well that in spite of your, uh, your your beliefs about the superiority of your school of psychotherapy, it doesn't really look all that different from other schools of psychotherapy in general. But therapist outcomes do vary within any of these schools of psychotherapy. And so one of the predictors of how well the clients do is who treated them, who was their therapist, whether it's psychodynamic psychotherapy or cognitive behavioral therapy or gestalt therapy or, or motivational interviewing. We certainly know there are differences in outcome based on who's delivering the motivational interviewing. So what's that about? So Terry and I went back through 70 years of psychotherapy research, reading everything we could find on therapist differences and what accounted for them. And, uh, and that's what produced this book, Effective Psychotherapists. And we found eight characteristics of therapists, never mind the school of psychotherapy, you know, eight characteristics of providers that are associated with their clients having better outcomes. And of course, also with their clients having worse outcomes at the other end of the scale. By far, the strongest effect was accurate empathy. It's the thing that, that predicts the most variance in outcome. Just listening well to your clients. All the way back to my 1980s study, where we didn't find much difference among the different behavior therapies we were studying. But therapist listening accounted for two-thirds of the variance in client outcome. It was, it was with that study that I went off to Norway when motivational intervening was born. I didn't go there with any concept of motivational intervening. So listening well to your clients. And that, 
and not just sitting there passively listening, but reflecting back to your clients your understanding. And it's an iterative process, so you get better and better, both of you, at understanding what the client needs. Positive regard, second one of Roger's characteristics. He called it unconditional positive regard. Affirmation is a, is a piece of it in, in motivational interviewing, but, but just expressing caring about the person, this particular person that you're working with. Genuineness, being yourself. So those are the three that Carl Rogers highlighted. Accurate empathy, positive regard, genuineness. And he called those necessary and sufficient causes for change. Thought maybe that's all you, all you needed to do. I don't believe that myself. Uh, but they certainly do predict getting better outcomes. Communicating acceptance as you are. Uh, now you have to you have to be different for me to approve of you. you know, but acceptance of you as you are. Having a focus. One of the things that emerges in psychotherapy research is therapists who know where they're going. They have clear goals in mind, shared goals, coming out of the Working Alliance research, you know, and have a clear plan for getting there and kind of stick with it, you know. So you're not wandering around from session to session, and there's a place you're trying to get to and you've got a plan for getting there. That doesn't mean you ignore everything else. Your client has a crisis, you talk about that, of course, too. But you always have the horizon in mind. You always know where you're going. Uh, and you, you know how you're planning to get there. So there's something about that um, that seems to be helpful. Hope. We think of that as a client characteristic, but it's also a therapist characteristic. Because if you're optimistic about your client's outcomes, they tend, it tends to come true. And if you're pessimistic and cynical about your client's outcomes, it also comes true. You know? uh, and there's good Pygmalion research on that. What you expect is what you get. Not completely, but it's a significant piece of the picture. You having hope for your clients. And when your clients aren't hopeful, lending them some of your hope. Evocation. Now that one's, we know that one in motivational interviewing. We're trying to evoke particular things, but it's not only motivational interviewing. In the person-centered field, there's this concept uh, from Jen Lynn and others called experiencing. And experiencing is talking about yourself in the present tense uh, with emotionally attached, not, not intellectually detached, but talking about myself right now and how I'm feeling what's going on in the present. Uh, and it's well documented that doing that during psychotherapy sessions is also associated with more change. So there's a particular thing that person-centered psychotherapists are looking for their clients to do. And using Rogerian skills actually evoke that kind of responding from their clients, which is then associated with better outcomes. So evocation is that idea that if the client will say and do these things during sessions, it's associated with better outcome. That's been true in motivational interviewing all along. But it also happens in other schools of psychotherapy. Functional analytic psychotherapy uh, also uh, has therapy relevant uh, responses. And so they're looking for particular kinds of things for clients to, to say. When I went to a workshop on that, they're doing coding of, of responses of therapists looking for these particular client responses. So I went up to the, the instructor after and said, Where'd you get this idea? He said, From motivational <laughs> And then finally giving information and advice. I mean, you, you know that a physician saying, I, I really encourage you to stop smoking in the interest of your health. I care about you and, and I'm worried for you. Two, three, four percent of people will stop smoking just in response to that kind of advice. And so that's something that, that therapists do, that providers do, that can be helpful as well. So those are the eight things that we came up with that we could find were characteristics of more effective helpers. And I think also it's more effective physicians, more effective nurses, more effective teachers, you know, more effective coaches. You know, this, this is something that crosses boundaries. Now, then I 
got, when I finished the book, I got thinking, you know, I've heard these things before. <laughs> well, accurate empathy is fairly foundational in motivational leadership. You're not doing MI if you're not skillful in, in uh, accurate empathy. Positive regard, yep, affirmation's been there from the very first article. Recognizing the, the positive things the person is doing and the positive attributes that they have. Genuineness, we hadn't said anything about. So we're fixing that. We really hadn't said anything about this, in this characteristic, which is an important characteristic of effective therapists, in the context of motivational interviewing. And I think it implies that, that when you're doing MI, you should be yourself in that process not putting on some kind of mask and pretending to be an expert or something else. So we are writing about that. Acceptance, yep, right there in the spirit of MI. Focus, well, focusing to one of our key tasks or processes, you know, so it, that's always been there, you know, and know where you're going. Uh, hope, yep, evoking hope and self-efficacy has been there from the very first article. Evocation is, is a key task or a key process in motivation and viewing. And information and advice we do as part of MI. So when you look at that, I began to ask, is this what, we, what we've been teaching all this time? Is this what we've been talking about? That effective therapeutic relationship. And we called it motivational interviewing. But those components are in there. You know? uh, motivational learning was never meant to, at least by us, to compete with other therapies. You should do MI instead of cognitive behavior therapy. You should do MI instead of psychoanalytic psychotherapy. It, it, it's, it blends with them. And in fact, when you look at the literature, when you look at the literature now, that is how it's being used. Motivational interviewing is being used with. And so what we see in clinical trials now is MI plus, 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 plus. We're doing, uh, yes, we're giving medication and we're doing motivational interviewing to help with adherence. Uh, yes, we're, we have these cognitive behavioral components and we're doing it in an MI kind of style. And so that also seems to be where we're headed. That this is not only, it can be, but not only a freestanding intervention, but a way of doing what else you do. It's a way of doing diabetes education. It's a way of doing coaching. It's a way of teaching. Oh, when you're training, you're doing this as a, as a way of teaching. You know? It's a way of doing primary care. It's a way of nursing. You know? it's, it's a way of delivering other kinds of services and who you are as a person while you're doing that. So what, you know, what, what does that mean for the, for the future of motivational interviewing? I think that's an interesting question for us to ponder. And I also begin to ask, are, are these separate, eight separate streams, or do they come from the same place, or do they kind of flow together, or you know, what's that about? Is there a, is there a higher order? And I think there is, you, you can see it in, broader therapeutic concepts. Toward the end of his life, Carl Rogers was thinking about and writing about presence. Your presence with people as a therapist. Uh, that kind of pulled together the, the threads that he had been talking about as a higher order concept of being a helper. Responsiveness is there in the literature, or it gets called real relationship, which kind of draws on these eight threads that Terry and I were, were writing. When I found Carl Rogers' last book, I, I literally wept. Uh, a way of being, because I said, that's, that's what I'm trying to do also. That's how I understand what I'm doing. You know? Not a technique, not a technique, but a way of, doing, of being with people. So, is MI operationalizing therapeutic relationship? It kind of looks like it in a way. And what does that mean for, for us, for trainers, for our field? Where, what is that? Is that why MI has been so appealing that people kind of get that this is a way of doing what I do? It's not being converted to some other orientation or some other theory. We never really have had much of a theory. We get 
criticized for that, but that's okay with me. Um, where are we going with that? There are also higher order constructs that you find in spirituality. And in, in my book, Loving Kindness, I wrote about this. The, the term in Judaism, the term chesed, um, is, a, is a complex idea that you find in, in Jewish scripture. Uh, and when it was being translated into English for the first time, the, the translator couldn't figure out an English word that would adequately capture chesed. And so put together two English words, loving, your intention, and kindness, your behavior, and created the word loving kindness. So that was actually created in a biblical translation uh, of, of the Jewish scripture and the concept chesed. In Christianity, the, the, the term agape is kind of selfless loving. Uh, same, captures the same kind of thing. Metta in, in, in uh, Buddhism and in Islam, Brahma, compassion. Every chapter of the Quran, at the beginning of it, talks about Rahma as a, as a characteristic of God and one that we are meant to emulate. And the same was true with Chesed. This is a characteristic of God that we are meant to emulate. And Agape, this is the characteristic of God that we are to emulate. And in a way, these streams are kind of flowing together into these concepts. Uh, well, I, I took a two-year, uh, it's called a uh, Living School for Action and Contemplation, from a Franciscan fireman, Richard Rohr, who happily lives in Albuquerque. And I've, I've been going to Richard's talks and reading his, his books uh, and just felt like this fellow's on the same road that I'm on in some way, but he's like way down the road. And so I want to learn from him. Uh, and then I found out about the Living School, which is two years of, of uh, pretty intensive study. I had to apply, I had to get letters of recommendation, which I hadn't done for a long time. <laughs> I had, to, I had to write essays about, you know, how I would make use of what I would learn in the school, and, and they had about a, th a thousand applications, uh, and I think there were 80 of us or so in the end who were chosen, and happily I was, uh, and it was a wonderful experience for me. And toward the end of two years, we were to do what was called an integration project, that is in, in some way pull together the things that have happened for you in, in this school. You, you could paint it, you could sing it, you can name it any way you want. And I'd been thinking about this book for about 10 years and kept feeling like, I'm, I'm not sure I'm really ready to write that yet. And as I got toward the end of the living school, I felt like, you know, I think now I can write this book. And so it was my integration project for, for Richard's uh, two year school. Uh, and I began to think about what what does it look like in practice? I mean, it's a lovely abstract concept, okay? But if you're going to do it, how do you actually do it? And I, I came up with 12 different themes, most of them scripturally based, that are pieces of loving kindness. Um, affirming people, and each of these has an opposite. Kind of criticizing and running people down. You know? Compassion. Contentment, being satisfied with what you have and grateful for what you have. Uh, being empathic, putting yourself in the other person's perspective. Forgiving, letting go, not hanging on to resentments and, and things that people did to you, but letting go of that and moving on. Generosity, giving away the resources that you have. Uh, gratitude, approaching life with a sense of uh, appreciation, for, the, for the, what we do have, whatever it is. Being helpful to others, actively helpful. It's a center for action and contemplation, Richard's Center. It says the most important word in the title is and, <laughs> because the contemplative spiritual aspect and the social justice action aspect support each other. Being hopeful. Being humble, not taking yourself too seriously. Being patient and yielding. 
for going to other people's interests. Those are the strands that I found of, of loving kindness. And again, does this sound familiar? Uh, I've, I've said I'm interested in, if I were doing research now, I'd be interested in how learning am I changes people. Because it's clear to me that it does. I've heard so many stories from people, from you, about this. And it certainly has changed me as well. When I think about what is it that changes, that's a pretty good list of candidates. You know? I, I think, I, I believe without scientific evidence, that as you begin to practice this person-centered way of being with people, this kind of patient, compassionate, affirming way of being, you begin to move in, in the direction of these things. As you affirm other people, you can become more affirming of yourself. As you become more accepting of others, you can become more forgiving and accepting of your own foibles and shortcomings. Uh, so it, it's interesting to me that my work seems to be coming together in a variety of ways. What felt like separate streams of, of writing and work uh, are kind of feeling like they flow together. And that's my talk for today. See that there's something they can do about it because it's incomplete. 